discussion about the uh, about the Egyptian Revolution, and I'll start um, with um, the the fall of Mubarak. And I think it's it's good to have clear in our minds at the start of, uh, of this um, what did and didn't happen in the 18 days in uh, January uh, and February. And I think perhaps the shortest way of doing this is to describe the three political forces, the three uh, essential elements which broke Mubarak's uh, rule. One, of course, was uh, the most visible element of the Egyptian revolution, the things that we all saw uh, on our television screens. I was there in the, in the 18 days and participated in the huge demonstrations in, uh, Tahir, in Tahir Square. Millions of Egyptians in Tahir and in the other squares uh, of, of Egypt. And it's impossible to imagine uh, that a 30-year-old dictatorship like Mubarak dictatorship could have been broken without those mass uh, mobilizations. Um, but as they built in force, there were two other elements which were also uh, crucial. One uh, was that in the uh, final days before uh, Mubarak, uh, Mubarak fell, really the, the two or three days before Mubarak uh, fell, um, there was uh, an increasingly powerful strike wave uh, which, took, uh, which took place of, uh, of workers in their workplaces joining, uh, joining the movement, participating in, in, the, in the movement, coming to here uh, and, and striking. And the, second, and the third element, uh, absolutely critical, almost definitional of a successful revolution really, was that there were splits that began to appear in, uh, the, armed, uh, in the armed forces. Soldiers uh, disobeying orders, uh, middle ranking officers uh, appearing in Tahir Square uh, among, the, among the crowds, uh, and the senior elements in the, uh, in the armed forces uh, deciding that they could no longer go on with Mubarak as head of state. And I think that one of the ways of looking at the Egyptian revolution was that it toppled Mubarak, broke some of the uh, police forces, later broke into the security uh, apparatus headquarters in Alexandria and in, in Cairo. Um, uh, but the regime that Mubarak headed, the military regime that he headed, um, made a gamble. The gamble was, if we get rid of Mubarak, perhaps the rest of us can stay. And the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the regime that's been in place since Mubarak's fall, is, if you like, a continuity Mubarak regime. It's determined to hold on to as much of the economic and political power that it wielded under Mubarak, but without Mubarak. And really, the uh, full course of the Egyptian uh, revolution will only be decided uh, when we see whether the mass movement, whether the ongoing revolution, is able to break the power of SCAF is able to continue the process of democratizing, of deepening the democratic uh, process in Egyptian, in Egyptian society. And that's exactly what the two comrades who are here today have been engaged in all this, uh, all, all this year. I think it was an important moment when the elections took place, because when the elections for the Egyptian parliament took place, the uh, scheme of the SCAF government, the plan of the SCAF government, was really to say this, you're going to get parliamentary elections, um, and that's all the democracy you're going to get. Leave to here, stop striking, stop destabilizing the economy, go home. That was the message of the, uh, of the, of, of the elections. And although um, the uh, system was far from democratic, and although there were many question marks over the legitimacy of the Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian parliament, one thing that was absolutely right in my view is that those people on the left decided that whatever the weaknesses in the process, it was right to have the far left represented as our candidates. It was right to go into the parliament. It was right on the first day uh, that uh, MPs uh, uh, like Nazir, um, when they took the oath, not only took the oath to parliament, but said afterwards the revolution continues and began immediately to attack the SCAF government. I think that was an important and correct uh, decision, uh, decision to take. And I congratulate the people who were part of doing, uh, of doing that. Um, the final thing I want to say, is to just repeat one more time, because you hear so often that the Egyptian revolution came from nowhere, that the Egyptian revolution was a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous event. And of course, in a certain sense, that is true, but there's a very important sense in which it is not true. It is not true in this sense, that there were many, many activists who were revolutionaries long before the revolution. They were part of the solidarity movement uh, with the second Palestinian Intifada at the turn of the decade. They were part of the anti-war uh, movement. The only other time 
when Tahrir Square has been occupied by Egyptians in 2003 in opposition uh, to the, um, occup to the uh, attack on Iran. They were part of the Kifaya movement, the Enough, uh, the Enough movement. They were part of the Solidarity movement with the Mahala Kubra uh, textile strikes in 2006 and 2008. And what I want to say is that the person I'm going to introduce now, Marwa Farouk, was part of all that. I've known her for 10 years as part of the Cairo conference. She was engaged in every single struggle that the Egyptian working class, the Egyptian democracy movement and the Egyptian left have been engaged in for 10 years. It's a very great pleasure of mine to welcome her to London. When I landed in Tahir Square, I phoned up my comrades who were already there and I said, I'm in my hotel, I want to come down to Tahir Square, but there's a tank parked at the end of my road. What should I do? They said, don't worry about it. Just walk past the tank, flag down any car that's coming, and it will take you to Tahir. So I did that. They were right. The first person I met when I arrived at Tahir Square, it, amazingly, out of millions of people, was Marwa Farouk. I've never been uh, as glad as I was then to see her, and I'm very glad to welcome her here in London and to introduce her to you.